All right. So uh, within the handbook that you would have been able to pick up at the registration desk, you would see a little bit of the information, the results that I'll be covering. And uh, behind me is the logo for the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you here this morning is the results from that survey that we rolled out over the winter and close at the end of February. So I'm going to first talk about Profit Production Link. As Paul just mentioned, I've had a long-standing, the, the economist at Western Beef has had a long-standing role in measuring cost of production with producers, going out to ranches, collecting financial and production information and generating cost of production benchmarks that we typically share with the industry and um, so why am I then now looking at production information and then I'll turn, turn to um, the results of the survey after just kind of explaining why I think they're useful to even uh, generate these benchmarks. So first off, when we talk about cost of production I'm usually reporting it in dollars per cow wintered and another useful way to look at costs is in terms of dollars per pound of calf weaned and that's called your unit cost of production or your break even and the way to calculate that, just a little formula up there on the screen your total cow herd cost divided by total pounds of calf weaned so the only ways to influence your break even price is either lower your total herd costs or increase your total pounds of calf weaned so how would we go about doing that on your operation? It's just by affecting your productivity, increasing your conception rate, increasing your calving rate, your wean rate, um, decreasing calf death loss, tightening your calving span. And I'm going to put this to you just another way to explain it. I can have a scenario where I'll have three ranchers and they all have the same cost of production. It costs them $700 per cow winter. And they all tell me that their average weaning weight is 550 pounds. So what do they need to sell their calves for to break even? So it's just a simple math. You can do $700 divided by 550 pounds. They need to sell those calves for $1.27 a pound. That only works if every cow that they wintered actually weaned a calf that they could market in the fall. And that tends to not be the case. There'll be cows that end up... Uh, losing their calf before calving or losing them at the time of calving or on pasture before weaning occurs. So we have to factor in wean percentage. So you can see just a quick little table. Yes, if every cow you wintered gave you a calf, you'd need to sell them for $1.27 a pound, but say only 80% of them did, you'd need to sell those same 550 pound calves for about $1.60 a pound. So that's my interest in, in figuring out where production is at with producers. So year over year comparison on your own operations is really important. I'm sure all of you are collecting the numbers, um, inventory counts and things that you need to know your conception rate and uh, your calving distribution and things like that. But then it also becomes helpful to have numbers to compare to. Am I on the right track? Is there areas where I'm really excelling in or are there areas where I could improve upon? What are others doing on their operations? And so that's what production benchmarks can help answer. So now we'll move into the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey and a little bit of background. So this survey is actually part of a larger project that I have underway where I've been interviewing young ranchers across the province this past winter and it's funded through the Agricultural Development Fund through the Ministry of Agriculture. And I had said in my application that I would pair it with a producer survey and so I actually had the opportunity to expand it beyond Saskatchewan and roll the survey out across Western Canada. And we basically have looked to revive and expand a survey last conducted in Alberta in 1998. They called it the Cow-Calf Audit Survey and it was done in the late 80s and then the last one in 1998 and involved over 1,700 producers at that time. So we had collaboration uh, with uh, various organizations. Here's a, a chart showing uh, there's a representative or two from each one of these organizations that participated in various conference calls and pondered over the questions that we'd include in the survey. So we had about 60 questions and we uh, offered it both in hard copy and online versions. We tried to keep fairly similar to what we had for questions back in 98 so that we could do some historical comparison. So some of the numbers I'll share with you, I'll also show you what the result was back in 98. We handed this survey out throughout uh, November, December, January at various events, uh, made the link available to producers to uh, access the survey online as well. And we, uh, we did not pay anyone to be in the survey. So lots of times everybody's time is really precious. 
And usually if a, a producer is being asked to complete a survey, then they're also getting paid, say, $10, $25. We, don't, we didn't offer that. Instead, you could co- uh, request a complimentary report with your indicators and uh, comparison with the overall average. And those reports started going out last week. I have a few more to send out, which I'll be doing uh, by the end of this week. It'll all be sent out to everybody, either by email or uh, mail copy. All right, so what's part of the reason for me as a researcher that I'm interested in uh, these production benchmarks is it helps guide our extension and our research efforts. We can kind of know what people are up to, uh, see if they're following recommended practices or not, and then we can kind of focus and, and do things uh, better to make sure that everybody's uh, operating at the best of their abilities. It helps us also validate anecdotal evidence that's out there. So I can think back to a producer meeting a couple years ago where a producer was saying, you know, I shifted my calving date. I've pushed it back into May, and I've really seen decline conception rate in my females. Is anyone else experiencing this? And, you know, we don't really have those numbers at hand, so conducting a survey like this on a regular basis can help us investigate when a producer raises a matter such as that. We can see what management practices are linked to strong production performance, and we essentially have an updated list of production benchmarks to share with the industry. Back in 98, those uh, indicators from Alberta were populated into a record-keeping program called Cow Chips. All right, so survey says, here we go, here's the results. Uh, there was results posted last week in the Beef Cattle Research Council, so if any of you subscribe to their blog, you may have seen some of these already. We had a little over 400 survey responses received. Did anyone in this room complete a survey? I know some of you did. Yeah, right on. Thank you so much. I know that I recognize some of the faces in the room, and I know that I've seen your name on some of the uh, surveys. You didn't have to put your name on them, but if you wanted to get, obviously, a, a complimentary report back, you would have had to... Uh, put your name on it. So the next time around we do this, I hope that everyone in the room that's a producer would like to complete this survey. So on average, our respondents were about 50 years of age. That's a little bit younger than the average age of producers in in, uh, Canada, but um, that's where we are at on average for the 411 responses received. An average number of years in the business was 28. Uh, Broke out by province, we had close to half of the responses from Alberta. Uh, 8% in BC, 24% from Saskatchewan, and 18% from Manitoba. And just in comparison to where the national beef cow herd lies, 40% Alberta, 30% in Saskatchewan, 12% Manitoba, and 5% of the national herd is in BC. On average, the number of females that calved in 2014 was about 170 for those surveyed. So what we asked them is everything from the start of breeding in 2013 following through to the weaning of their 2014 calf crop. And uh, you can just see the breakout by herd size. Um, about f- close to 40% had 100 cows or fewer, um, near 30% between 100 and 200, and the, and the remainder at 200 plus. Then on the terms of a number of reproduction indicators, average cow to bull ratio was 24 to 1. I think in the handout that you'll see, I have it saying 25 to 1. Sorry about that one uh, one little uh, number, one extra cow there. It was 24 to 1 on average. Breeding season length at 92 days. We actually recommend 63 days or fewer. So how many producers actually stayed within that recommendation? It was under a quarter. And uh, we also recommend, because heifers have longer postpartum intervals, so they take a longer time to heal after having their first calf before they resume cycling again, we ask that you breed your heifers earlier than the rest of the herd. Uh, About 26% of survey respondents were doing that, and the average number of days earlier was about two weeks. Uh, Average conception rate was 93%, so on cows, number percent open was 7%, and on heifers, 10%. So when you think about your own operations, are you doing better than than the average here, or uh, about on par, or or is there areas where you can improve? That's what these benchmarks can can prove useful to you to to take home and, and look at your own numbers. So on the breeding management side, about 60% our producers pregnancy checked some or all of their cows. And then you can see after, uh, following here is the 98%, uh, from 98, the results. 
This is an improvement from a little under 50% that were pregnancy checking back in 98. 66% pregnancy checked some or all of their heifers. 64% semen tested their bulls. That's an improvement from 51% back in 98. 18% utilized artificial insemination and 11% estrus synchronization. There was a question with nine different criteria on bull selection. So producers were asked to vote or tally up, place a one, two, or three besides the criteria that they go to most when uh, choosing a herd sire for their herd. And the top ranking criteria were breed, confirmation, and birth weight. So I just did a simple scoring. If you rank something as a one, it got three points. And obviously, if you rank something as a three, you got one point. So how did everything fall out after that? EPDs, pedigree, performance tests, polling, price, and the number nine criteria based on votes was genetic tests. In terms of calving start, 36% of the producers surveyed were calving in the month of March. I split it out between uh, early March and late March, wondering if that would make a difference, and it didn't. There was 18% on either side of the 15th of the month. And uh, you can see this is an improvement from, in 98, the, the most common calving month start was actually February. If I break it out between commercial and, and purebred producers, average calving start was March 15th on the commercial side and February 8th for the, the purebred producers in the survey. So calving distribution, we'll actually have a, an announcement shortly, right after my presentation with a 21-day calving challenge. It's a, calving distribution is a really important calculation on your operation. You do, ideally want to have 60% or more of your females calving in the first 21 days of your calving season. And 42% uh, of the producers surveyed in the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey met this target, which is an improvement from 1998 where uh, the average was 48% of, uh, of cows calving in the first 21 days. For the this survey, it's 55%. So, in 1998, 48% of females had calved in the first 21 days, and in, for the Western Canadian cow-calf survey, it was 55%. And the reason that that's important, calves, they can gain somewhere between two to two and a half pounds a day. If we're expecting calf prices to be in the range of $3 a pound this fall, uh, an extra 21 days earlier calving gets you about $130 to $160 per calf. In terms of how the calf crop uh, fared, there was an average calf death loss of 7%. Less than one quarter of the producers surveyed implanted their calves. And of those who implanted, uh, less than 20% implanted twice. So that would be prior to weaning and at weaning were the options. And then they also had to indicate if it was just non-replacements or if it was all calves. 19% uh, provided creep feed to their 2014 calves. Wean percentage on average was 85%, and uh, average pounds wean per cow exposed was 534. We asked producers a couple questions on how they uh, weaned and marketed their 2014 calves. So a little over 70% sold nearly half of their calves right at the time of weaning. So that might be a little bit of an anomaly. We have to think back to what was happening last fall. We had really strong prices, so it made sense to capture the cash and, and get them sold. 9% uh, of producers preconditioned their calves for between 30 and 60 days. And it's not all their calves. It's, you had to indicate what various things you did by percentage. So uh, there was 9% 9, 9 of them that, that preconditioned a portion of their calves. 35% retained a portion of their calves to background and sell as yearlings. And another 9% retained calves to feedlot finish. Um, and when it came to marketing method, 80% of uh, producers say, surveyed sold calves at weaning, uh, that were selling calves at weaning, were actually selling them via live auction. So that was still the preferred method 
at least for uh, looking at the 2014 marketing of uh, wean calves. In terms of trace mineral provision, 95% provide trace mineral, either trace mineralized salt or loose mineral in the summer and 98% in the winter. And this is an improvement from uh, 98 where it was 84% in the summer and 90% in the winter. Less than 20% body condition score. That's actually down slightly from where we were in 98 where it was 23%. So body condition scoring is the hands-on feeling to, uh, for fat cover on your females. Average cow weight was about 1,375 pounds. But when we asked producers to clarify if that was an estimate or an actual scale weight, 22% said they were actually providing a scale weight. 91% vaccinate, that's up from 90%, so just barely up, uh, just 1% from 98 74% restrain cattle to treat on pasture. Either they have a handling system out in their pasture or their uh, lariat and the horse to take the animal down and treat it. And when asked where they inject on the animal, 8% were injecting in the rump and hind quarter. This was a bit of big, bigger issue back in 98 where close to 30% were injecting in those areas where the preferred location is the neck. When it comes to grazing management on native and tame pasture, uh, most producers were using rotational grazing systems. You can see 67% on native and 70% 70, 70 on tame, 30% uh, continuous grazing on native, 19% on tame, and then uh, 3 and 11% use intensive grazing management, which uh, some, something what Jim has just uh, talked to us about here. Pasture rejuvenation, when asked the question on how often they rejuvenate their pastures, you can see that one third of producers said they never did anything to rejuvenate their pastures. 38% um, said it would be at least 11 years or more between efforts to rejuvenate their pastures. Uh, one quarter is every six to 10 years, and there was a 3% every one to five years. In terms of winter feeding, 47% indicated that they tested their feed for quality, but only 80% of those actually used the results to balance their rations. So uh, likely what's happening for some of them, they're testing their feed in order to sell it, and they want to be able to provide that feed test when uh, marketing some of their hay off their operation. A little over half sort their cows into groups for winter feeding, and when asked how they sort them, 83% um, was by age, so keeping the younger cows separate from the rest of the herd. Two-thirds was by condition and 26% uh, by stage, so that'd be stage of pregnancy. Winter feeding methods, so we had a list of winter feeding methods and producers were just asked to, to indicate which of those they used. So you can see for the most part they're still strongly using bale feeders and bale processors for part of their winter feeding um, methods, but then I think there's still also strong representation coming through in terms of the extensive grazing, uh, extensive systems, so bale grazing at 33%, swath grazing and crop residue at 17%, stockpile grass at 18%, and standing corn at 6%, and then you can see there was uh, about 17% indicated that they use other methods, and most popular was silage, provision of pellets, and total mixed rations. So 40% have three or more winter feeding methods, and that's sort of a recommendation that we have here at Westman Beef, is that don't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to have a few different plans of how you're gonna take your cows through the winter and the different methods that you will utilize. Um, so with that, I just want to say that the full results for this study, they went out to the committee members that I showed on that map. Um, back last week, about Thursday, I'm just getting comments back from all of them, but I'll be posting the full results to our website at this location, uh, wbdc.sk.ca backslash wccs.htm later this week. And um, with that, I welcome any questions you have.